The psalmist calls us to worship with these words, which are a plea for God's help and trust that God has the power to meet his needs. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. And now let us worship and praise our God, our fortress, as we sing together hymn number 260, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and God's truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, our God who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us now as the family of God come with faith and humility as together we confess our sins to God. Let us pray. God of mercy, you sent Jesus Christ to seek and to save the lost. We confess that we have strayed from you and turned aside from your way. We are misled by pride, for we see ourselves pure when we are stained and great when we are small. We have failed in love, neglected justice, and ignored your truth. Have mercy, O oh God, and forgive our sins. Return us to paths of righteousness through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And now let us individually confess our personal sins in silence to God.
Amen. Dear friends, hear the good news of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Dear friends, believe the gospel. In Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven and cleansed. To his name be glory and praise forever. Amen. Please be seated. It's our privilege at this time to receive uh, individuals into the life and membership of First Presbyterian Church. I invite them to come forward with their elder sponsor. First, Mr. Glenn A. Rose uh, with elder sponsor Jim Rayner. Uh, Glenn will join by profession of faith uh, and baptism. Next, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Michael Morrison Woody, uh, Mike and Lydia with elder sponsor uh, Louis Lamb. Mike joins by transfer from the Graves Memorial Presbyterian Church of Clinton, North Carolina, and Lydia by transfer from First Baptist Church of Abermore, North Carolina. We welcome these individuals this Sunday morning. We shall proceed first with the reception of Mike and Lydia, and then with the reception of Glenn. Mike and Lydia, you have been received in the membership of this congregation by letter from another Christian body, and as we do this, we reflect that we are members of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, and because of this, you do not come to us as strangers, but as a brother and a sister in the Lord. The unity of the body of Christ is affirmed for us in Paul's letter to the Ephesians in the fourth chapter, where Paul reminds us, there is one body and one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. I address this question to you. Do you promise to be a faithful member of this congregation, giving of yourself in every way, and by so doing, fulfilling your calling as a disciple of Jesus Christ, the Lord? Will you say, I do? Okay. We now proceed with the reception of Glenn A. Rose, who will be <clears throat> baptized as he makes his public profession of faith. Let us hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. You did not choose me, but I choose you and appoint you that you should go and bear fruit. Glenn, know that the promises of God are for you, that by baptism God puts his sign on you to show that you belong to him and gives you Holy Spirit as a guarantee that sharing Christ's reconciling work, you will also share his victory, that dying with Christ to sin, you will be raised with him to newness of life. Glenn, in presenting yourself for baptism, you announce your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you show that you want to study Him, know Him, love Him, and serve Him as His chosen disciple. Will you show your resolve by answering these following questions? Who is your Lord and Savior? Do you trust in Him? Do you intend to be His disciple, to obey His word, and to show His love? And will you be a faithful member of this congregation, giving of yourself in every way? And will you seek the fellowship of Christ's church wherever you may be? Our Lord Jesus Christ ordered us to teach those who are baptized do you, the people of, ch of this church, promise to tell this new disciple, Glenn Rose, the good news of the gospel, to help him know all that Christ commands, and by your fellowship to strengthen him and her family ties with the household of God? Will the congregation say, we do? We do. Let us pray. Precious God, we thank you for your faithfulness promised in this sacrament and for the hope we have in your son, Jesus. As we baptize with water, baptize us with Holy Spirit, so that what we say may be your word and what we do may be your work. By your power, 
May we be made one with Christ our Lord in common faith and purpose. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you hold that for me? I'll pick it up again. Then will you kneel here and what is your full name? Glenn Allen Rose. Glenn Allen Rose. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and abide with you both now and forevermore. Amen. We stand. We have received into the universal church, the, the Holy Catholic Church, Glenn Allen Rose, and we become members of his extended family whereby he continues to grow in faith and service to Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior. Let us stand now as we sing the baptismal response for an adult baptism as printed in the worship bulletin. Pray after that. Let us again unite in prayer. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, we praise you for calling us to be a servant people and for gathering us together in the body of Jesus Christ. And we are grateful that you have chosen to add to our number these brothers and sisters in the faith. Together may we live in your spirit and so love one another that we may have the mind of Jesus Christ our Lord to whom we give honor and glory forever. Amen. As Jim Eller is giving our new members their certificates, I remind you that at the close of this service, we invite you to come forward uh, to meet these new members. Please introduce yourself uh, to the elder sponsor, uh, Louis Lamb, for uh, Mike and Lydia, and Jim Randa for Glenn. We welcome you to the body of Christ. You're welcome. And Lydia, God bless you. Okay. Be seated. This morning, too, we have the pleasure of participating uh, in another sacrament as Jack and Jan Stone present their infant daughter for the sacrament of baptism. The elder sponsor is Mr. Max Cook, and we ask them to come forward. Uh, proud members of the family are sitting right here on this first pew. I can tell it by how they are smiling. Uh, Jen and Jack, we hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority on in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. Obeying the word of our Lord Jesus and sure of his presence, we baptize those whom he has called to be his own. In Jesus Christ, God has promised to forgive our sins and has joined us together in the family of faith, which is his church, the household of God. He has delivered us from darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. In Jesus Christ, God has promised to be our father and to welcome us as brothers and sisters of Christ. Jen and Jack know that the promises of God are for you and for your children. And by baptism, God puts his sign on you and them to show that all of you belong to him and gives you Holy Spirit as a guarantee that sharing Christ's reconciling work, you and your children will also share in his victory, that dying with Christ to sin, you and they will be raised to newness of life. Jen and Jack, in presenting little Jody for baptism, you announce your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You show that you want her to know him, to study him, to love him, and to serve him as his chosen disciple. 
Will you show your purpose by answering these questions? Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ. Do you trust in Him? Do you intend little Jody to be His disciple, to obey His word, and to show His love? Yes. Okay, Max. I'm sure that my dear late friend, Johnny Clements, who is grandfather of these two children here, precious in the sight of God, was rejoicing in heaven now to see this moment. Our Lord Jesus has ordered that us to teach those who are baptized. Do you, the people of the church, promise to tell this new disciple, Jody Elizabeth Stone, the good news of the gospel, to help her know all that Christ commands and by your fellowship to strengthen her family ties with the household of God. The congregation will respond by saying, we do. We do. Let us pray. O oh God, who called us from death to life, we give up ourselves to you and with the church through all ages. We thank you for your saving love in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Scottish church, someone like this is called a beetle. Not an insect, but a person who does something on be to assist the pastor. Yeah. What is the full name? Jody Elizabeth Stone. Okay. Jody Elizabeth Stone, child of the covenant. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and abide with you both now and forevermore. Amen. We have witnessed the baptism of Jody Elizabeth Stone, and we have become members of her extended family. For as a child of the covenant, she will know of God's grace, the Spirit of God working in her by your faithfulness to Christ as Lord and Savior. As members of the household of God, we with her family will enable her to claim Jesus Christ as Savior and to be confirmed one day in the years to come. Let us respond to the sacrament of baptism as we sing the response for the baptism of an infant. Let us stand. and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian. I invite you to reach for the friendship pads located on the center aisle. As we sign, we reflect the oneness of the body of Christ as we gather for worship this uh, Sunday morning. A special welcome to those of you who are guests and visitors, both uh, those of you who are here because of uh, Morris Hill College uh, singing and worship, and those of you who are here because you wanted, for other reasons, to worship this Sunday here at First Presbyterian Church in downtown Raleigh. I invite you uh, to reach for the uh, cards in, in front of you with a red ribbon on it if you're a visitor. It would be uh, helpful to us, particularly those sitting in front of you and behind you who do not have the benefit of the friendship pad, in order for them to, uh, as worshipers, to greet you this Sunday in a very warm way. A special welcome as well to those of you who worship with us by way of television. We are First Presbyterian Church of Raleigh, North Carolina. We're located across from the uh, state capitol, and we're thankful for your participation in worship with us this Sunday. Uh, if your schedule permits in the future, we would uh, welcome you here in this sanctuary on Sunday morning for worship. We're thankful for your prayers and for your financial contributions, which helped undergird this uh, special ministry. After the service of worship this Sunday, for members and guests alike, uh, you are invited for coffee and fellowship in the Balkan Parlor, which is a room uh, to my right to your left as you would uh, exit the uh, sanctuary. And if you are here, uh, 
as a visitor this Sunday and you're looking for a church home in, in the body of Christ, we would invite you to join with us in Christian discipleship and in service to our Lord. There's a place to check on the Friendship page, your interest in receiving information or in receiving a visit or in a place also for you to check if you're interested in becoming a member. And if you would desire information about how one does become a member of the body of Christ uh, through this particular uh, branch of the body, uh, First Presbyterian, uh, there's an officer present uh, each Sunday up front uh, in this room, the Anderson Room, who is prepared to talk with you about how one becomes a member by transfer of letter, as uh, Michael and Lydia did, or by profession of faith, or by, as uh, Glenn did this Sunday, or by reaffirmation of faith. For those of you who are living in the uh, Raleigh area, perhaps for a short period of time, there is also the procedure of affiliate membership. Uh, this is particularly helpful for those of you who have been transferred here because of business or because you are a student in one of the area colleges and universities. You may identify with us uh, during your tenure in the area, uh, identify with us as your community of faith. So we welcome all to worship here at First Presbyterian on this Sunday during this season of Lent. Our Old Testament lesson comes from the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. We're reading from chapter 2, verses 15 and 17, and from chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Hear the word of God. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, for you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to our God. Particularly for our television audience, uh, we'd like to acknowledge that we have with us the Mars Hill Choir uh, here uh, yesterday for a choir festival, and we're privileged to have them participating in worship uh, this Sunday morning. We continue our lectionary passages for this first Sunday of the season of Lent, reading now from Psalm 32, which will be followed by our gospel lesson from Matthew 4, the temptation of Jesus, and our topic for this Sunday, the crucible, Jesus, for Jesus and us. Hear now the word of God. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silence, my body wasted away, though my groaning, through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. 
You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with gr glad cries of deliverance. I will Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. We continue on now with our gospel lesson from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and... On their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. A crucible is a container so tempered, so strong, that it will not melt when it is used to melt ore or metal. It is tested because, in, in a way that is true as a, as a crucible, when it does not fuse with what is placed in it. And they can be of all sizes, all shapes, some large, some small crucibles. In many ways, our life becomes a crucible. When placed before us are those areas which would cause us to fuse to them as we are tempted to do so, to deny God, to deny self, and to live really apart from God by pursuing vested selfish interest, which is really a deny of self as we're created in the image of God. For over nine years, I served as a pastor of uh, First Presbyterian Church in Wichita Falls, Texas. And there in Wichita Falls was Shepherd Air Force Base, which at the time had as, it, as its mission the training of all the NATO pilots. And so it was an international community with people from all over the world, from all, not well, from the, from the countries of, of NATO, basically. And uh, early on in my ministry there, there were still pilots uh, on duty at the base who had served in the Vietnam War. They weren't flying. They were basically uh, administrative responsibilities. They had aged out of the cockpit. And there was a gentleman there, an officer, who had not only been in Vietnam, but had been a prisoner of war at the infamous Hanoi Hilton, a euphemism for a cesspool of a place where emaciated bodies were caged. And at a devotional one, one morning at the church, this officer stood and admitted that when you went into Hanoi Hilton thinking that somehow you could resist with your own strength, that you were strong enough to withstand psychological and physical coercion, it was at that point that you were most vulnerable. Most vulnerable. Because it said, with extreme testing, which was really physical abuse, and with seduction being offered, you could be twisted every way imaginable. Every way imaginable to betray yourself and your comrades and your country. 
You could buy into the lie that it was all right to do the right thing for the wrong reason. And that's why T.S. Eliot calls that temptation the greatest treason. In our gospel lesson, Jesus goes to the wilderness and is tested by God and tempted by Satan. But there in the wilderness, we read of what Jesus does on behalf of you and me. His obedience to God's mission, which will take him to the cross to release you and me from bondage to sin and death. And so we enter this special season of the year during the cycle of the Christian calendar. We have come out of Epiphany. We have come out of the Transfiguration. We have come to the place now where we are moving toward Calvary and the humiliation and the suffering of Jesus and are very much aware of our own cultability, our own sinfulness. So the season of Lent and the scriptures remind us of how much we depend upon the one who can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And so our topic this Sunday, the crucible for Jesus and for you and me. And the focus for our gospel lesson is this. We learn from this gospel lesson what sort of character Jesus is, whom we can trust as Messiah to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. We learn what kind of character Jesus is, what sort of person Jesus is, who can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Yes, Jesus is fully God and fully human. And in this passage, we have, in a, in, in a very vivid way, the testing Jesus goes through as being fully human. It is paradoxical but true for Jesus and for each one of us in this sanctuary or who may be watching over TV that it is at the point of our strength that we are most vulnerable. It is the point of our gifts that we are most vulnerable. As that pilot and Hanoi Hilton admitted when he went in, shot down, yes, he was tough enough and strong enough to withstand all that would be done to him and Hanoi Hilton. And he couldn't. It is the point of our strength and our gifts that we are most vulnerable. The Wall Street Journal several weeks ago carried a feature story on someone who's a household word in North Carolina. If you follow ACC basketball, I'm sure there's not, there's not anyone in this room who does not know who Mr. Jerry Stackhouse is, the former All-American player for the University of North Carolina who left after his sophomore year to play professional basketball for the 76ers of Philadelphia. And the article in the Wall Street Journal attempted to analyze why it was that Mr. Stackhouse was so well received in the Philadelphia area when he was playing for a team with the worst record. I think it's still the worst record, according to the sports page this Sunday morning, the worst record in professional basketball. How could a person be so so well received when playing for the worst team. As the article attempted to analyze, it was because of Mr. Jerry Stackhouse's home, down home qualities. He was a boy from a small town in North Carolina, Kinston. He, according to the Wall Street Journal, was a hot item for advertisers. Because he was so genuine, people responded to him. The article highlighted the fact that though he had become an instantaneous millionaire, that though he had tremendous athletic prowess, he was someone who had not gotten a big head. He was someone whom others in the community, people in the community could approach. His winsome smile was, was, was an imitation to say, gee, I'm just Jerry Stackhouse. Uh, you know, it's all right to talk with me. He had not developed a big head. He still had those combed down qualities of someone from a small community in North Carolina. Despite his athletic prowess, despite his newfound financial status and power, he did not flaunt it. A product of a home which had taught him values, a product of a mom and a dad who had raised him right. At times, I'm a cynic, though. And I wonder, as I read, how long will it last for Mr. Jerry Stackhouse? How long will it last? Will, will he be able to withstand the pressures which will come to him relentlessly because of his status 
and his athletic prowess, how long will he be able to resist? Because it is at the point of our gifts, of our strengths, that we are most vulnerable. For Jerry Stackhouse and for any one of us, we can only pray that he will be able to resist spiritually what many people would find very hard to resist, the use of power and status and money, to resist using that for selfish ends. Yes, it is the point of our strength, of our gifts, that we are most vulnerable. We may have a good voice. We may have leadership. We may be a charmer. We have gifts given to us with life. And many times it is a point of our strengths that our Achilles heels surface because of the power of sin and its seduction, that it's all right to do the right thing for the wrong reason. Well, Jesus had many gifts, had tremendous strength as a person, strengths as a person. And the scripture tells us here in Matthew that he is driven by God to the wilderness to be tested. He has just been baptized, just been confirmed as God's Messiah in the baptism. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Now God sends him to the wilderness to be tested and Satan tempts. It's interesting that the Greek word for as is used two different words, God tests and Satan tempts. As a human being, Jesus had to confirm again that he would only be obedient to God's power and to no other power in order to fulfill his mission. He would resist the misuse of his gifts for worldly ends. He would resist that. All those avenues which are open to people who have money and position and status and power and on and on and on to choose only one avenue, the way of the cross for you and for me. As a human being, but also the son of God, Jesus, you see, carried a full arsenal of power, a full arsenal of power. And in this testing experience in his being tempted, there is a struggle of his soul. Will he use it for God's ends or for the world's selfish ends? It's a struggle of the soul. Which voice will win out, the voice of death or the voice of life for you and me? And so there are three temptations offered by Satan. Turn stones into bread, Jesus. <clears throat> they love that as Messiah. <clears throat> Use divine intervention as a show of power. Use a magical trick. Draw from a pinnacle of a temple 450 feet up and be caught by God's angels and people will flock to your cause. That's the second one. The third one, idolatry. If you worship me, all this is yours. Jesus answers the temptations of Satan by remembering and referring to the book of Deuteronomy and the experience of the Israelites in their wilderness experience of 40 years where they failed the test. Each response he gives to Satan is from the book of Deuteronomy. Whereas the Israelites failed in the test, Jesus will remain faithful to God as God's son, obedient to God only and to the power of God in his life. He will use the power not for the world's ends but for God's ends and God's mission for him is to be a Messiah, to give his life, to free you and me from the bondage of sin. In the crucible of that wilderness experience we learn something of the character of Jesus. We learn something of the character of Jesus. Jesus will never forsake God's mission, and thus, in the character of Jesus, we learn that Jesus will never forsake you and me. As metal is made stronger because of the testing in the crucible. In the crucibles of our testing, we are made stronger spiritually to resist, to resist. But in the crucible of our testing, we are minded, though, that many times we have failed we have failed. There's a struggle of the soul. 
And the biblical scholar Douglas R.A. Hare reminds us that the point of this passage here is Jesus' obedience to God. The character of Jesus is revealed as being fully human as well as being fully divine, but it is the humanness of Jesus which will not deviate. He will not seek another avenue apart from his humiliation and suffering. And we can identify with testing for how easy it is to think that if we can depend upon an individual, an institution, then everything will, in that person, institution can make us happy. And we, and we learn that other people too, our institutions are flawed as we are flawed, and all that turns to ashes. We think that if we can just have enough money or security or a good job, then we'll have it made. And we find out too that all that can turn to ashes because there's nothing perfect, nothing perfect at all. And if we have a sense of, of worth, which at times is down, and we attempt to, to, to modify that with substance abuse, thinking that somehow with that we can cope, we find out that substance abuse, too, is like ashes, death. And the list goes on and on. For in the crucible, we learn that our characters are flawed. There are times when we have not messed the test. There are times when we have been seduced, when we too have rationalized that it is all right to do the right thing for the wrong reason. We have sugarcoated it. We have done it in a very sophisticated way, and it seems so plausible for us to give in because that's the way of sin to justify what we want. In the crucible, though, Jesus meets the test, and in the crucible of his testing, we learn something of the character of Jesus, the character of a law which is willing to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. We cannot extricate ourselves in the crucible because what we have yielded to has fused to us. A crucible, if it meets the test, does not fuse to what is put in it. In the crucible of life, we have fused with that which has tempted us, seduced us, and we need a power from beyond ourselves to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. What well, does it matter for us that we have a Savior whose character we can trust? It is that in the character of Jesus we see God's love reaching down to us to extricate us, to heal us in our brokenness, to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Yes, we know the painful words of Paul as he echoes those words in his epistle to the Romans. For Paul, too, found out that you cannot will not to sin. You cannot will not to sin. Paul realized that with all of his willing, all his intellect, he could not will or could not think himself strong enough in a position not to sin. And so he writes these words of a lament, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Paul knows the answer, and we claim that answer this Sunday in Lent. It is in the one whose character is such that as Messiah, he can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. In Genesis 2 and 3, we have the tragic parallel of Adam and Eve who did not meet the test, who bought the lie of seduction by the serpent that it was wrong not to be as wise as God, that it was all right to do the right thing for the wrong reason. After all, what does more knowledge? What's harmful in that? Psalm 32 reminds us that the righteous person is not the sinless person, but the forgiven person. During Lent, in humility, we are mindful of the fact that we are those who live under hope because we are forgiven people in Jesus Christ. We are sinners. We have been seduced. We have not met the test. And there are flaws in our character, but despite that, God loves us in Jesus Christ. And the sinlessness of this human being who resisted, who was fully human and fully God, that righteousness covers us in our sinfulness. We are righteous through the righteousness of Christ because we live as forgiven sinners. And so as we make this pilgrimage to Calvary toward Holy Week, 
We just do so in humility, acknowledging the character of this one as Messiah who does for us what we cannot do for ourselves and who, as a human being, claim the promise of God which we must claim. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. In the crucible of life, in our weakness, we stake our hopes on this one as Messiah who extricates us and saves us and forgives us as we go through life serving as forgiven sinners. Amen. Let us now affirm those important things which we believe as Christians as we say together the words of the Apostles' Creed. All who are able will please stand. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We're now called to a special prayer litany for the Lenten season. It's included in your bulletin. Let us pray together responsibly. O Christ, out of your fullness we have received grace upon grace. You are our eternal hope. You are patient and full of mercy. You are generous to all who call upon you. O oh Christ, fountain of life and holiness, you have taken away our sins. On the cross, you were wounded for our transgressions and were bruised for our iniquities. O oh Christ, obedient unto death, source of all comfort, our life and our resurrection, our peace and our reconciliation. O Christ, Savior of all who trust you, hope of all who die for you, and joy of all the saints. Jesus, Lamb of God. Jesus, bearer of our sins. Jesus, Redeemer of the world. God of love, as in Jesus Christ, you gave yourself to us so that we give ourselves to you, living according to your holy will. Keep our feet firmly in the way where Christ leads us. Make our mouths speak the truth that Christ teaches us. Fill our bodies with the life that is Christ within us. In his holy name we pray. Amen. And now let us continue in the spirit of prayer as we lift up our intercessions and supplications for God's people everywhere. Let us bow in prayer. Our God, you have called upon us to bear each other's burdens and to remember our brothers and sisters in prayer and to uphold all your people everywhere. And therefore today, O oh Lord, we want to remember before you all those who are in need, those who have lost loved ones in recent days, 
those who are ill and in pain, those who are preparing for an operation, those who are awaiting for a physician's diagnosis and are fearing the worst, those who are nervous, anxious, and afraid of life, those who feel shame and guilt because of their sins, those who are hungry and cold, those who are refugees with no home, those who are unemployed with no work, those who are persecuted, and those who have lost their freedom, and those who must live under the ravages of war, such as the people of Bosnia and Israel and Palestine and Rwanda and Northern Ireland. Out of your great riches, O God, supply the needs of all those who are distressed in body, mind, or spirit. And our Lord, we would pray for ourselves too. Grant us the ability to see ourselves in all our weaknesses and to see you in all of your great power. Then help us to bring our weaknesses to your power, that by your love, you may grant us the strength to do those things which we cannot do and to be those things which we cannot be. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us worship the Lord.
Go in grace and go in peace and go with the power of God which sustains us as we live life as forgiven Christians, claiming the power of Christ for us and the voice of life and not the voices of death. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you, both now and forevermore.